Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many are here tonight, but it's uh, nice to have a, a meeting like this to keep the society going in poor and bad times. I should explain that uh, although it's Nottingham's uh, organist society, I live in Leicestershire in Loughborough, which is only a mile or two from the boundary. And there are other members in Leicestershire of the Nottingham Society. What I want to talk about tonight is about something in Leicestershire that is a bit special, where the organs are, who has built them, what the tradition is, uh, and so on. And uh, so it's to introduce organs in Leicestershire to the Nottingham Society. Well, if you go back in history, of course, um, then uh, there was no division between the counties. And it's quite good fun to look at cartoons from 500 years ago, and some of them are really entertaining. I was wondering whether to show a few tonight, but one or two are a bit uh, mischievous, like the one that advises organists uh, who always need somebody to pump the organ for them. So they should marry a beefy lady who can do the pumping for them. Uh, it's a bit mischievous. And if you go to the next uh, slide, you'll see a, a famous uh, uh, cartoon by Gerard Hoffner. And he was, uh, of course, always interested in the, in the amusing side of organists and the things, contortions that they have to do to play their organ. If we go on a little bit further, uh, we come to a, a very important date in the history of organs. And if we can have the next slide, uh, Ian, I should thank Ian for organizing all the slides. Uh, and uh, as we are living about 40 miles apart, it's a bit of a problem tonight. We're managing well so far. Oliver Cromwell, of course, was puritanical and he had some very strong views of organs when he was around. Thank goodness he's not around now. He described an organ as a dangerous and anti-Christian machine invented by the Scarlet War, and he really meant the occupants of the Vatican, of course, in Rome. Um, he encouraged his soldiers to pawn organ pipes and turn them into pots for ale. Uh, and that is a, a novel use for lead tin alloys, I suppose, that we use for organ pipes. He regarded them as being expensive extras um, and destructing or obstructing the presentation of God's word. And he was all for rooting them out. And uh, he was afraid that the attentions of congregations would be diverted by the goings on of organs and organists. And the result is there are only one or two organs in Leicestershire that are pre-Oliver Cromwell. And we'll come to those it in a minute. The next slide, uh, Ian. This is one of the oldest organs in the county. It's at Staunton Harold, which is a stately home just outside uh, Loughborough, going towards uh, Ashby de la Zouche. Uh, and Staunton Harold in Oliver Cromwell's days couldn't make up its mind whether it was Anglican or Catholic. And the church that is in the grounds is an estate church was left untouched by Oliver Cromwell, and it's still there today. It's part of the National Trust, in fact. But the stately home is now a function uh, building and very effective for uh, wedding, uh, wedding uh, receptions and conferences of that sort. You can see the, uh, the organ here. It's just a handful of stops, uh, a one manual organ. And when I first came to Loughborough, I tried to find ways of playing the organ. And I was told it was out of bounds to the people who are not National Trust members. Well, eventually I found out uh, uh, how to get hold of the National Trust uh, man in charge. And he told me, of course, the church, we always have our services by candlelight, no electricity in the church. So eventually he took me up to the organ and showed me how the pump worked. And I was amused to discover that the pump was worked from a 13 amp PowerPoint, very modern. And there was something else attached to the PowerPoint as well as the blower, and that was a kettle. And that enabled the organist to make himself a cup of tea during a, a rather boring sermon 
uh, at Staunton Harold. Well, Staunton Harold is still available today. It's a very interesting place to go to for all sorts of reasons. There's a garden centre near, and there are some uh, craft and uh, art uh, places in the grounds. It's well worth a visit, quite beside the organ. The next slide. Well, what happened to organs after 1660? Well, uh, they were rebuilt. Cathedrals quickly re-equipped themselves with organs using just a few national builders, and the few national builders uh, were mainly in London. Not all, but a lot of them were. And we, we've had some fun uh, in a, a, a church uh, study group that we have here in Loughborough, finding out how they got organs from London to Loughborough. And it so happens that Loughborough is on the Grand Union Canal. And we're pretty certain that all these organs were shipped around the country by canals, certainly not by motorways and, uh, and, and lorries. So all the builders were journeyman builders based in London and uh, were available to people in other parts of the country. The next slide. These are some of the builders and the tuners, and they dis were distinguished between them. The builders were concerned with construction. They were engineers, uh, largely. The tuners were people who looked after them and were locally placed on the whole. So every large town or city had tuners, but not necessarily builders. Right, let's move on. Now, these are some of the national builders that are pre-1800, and you will know some of these names. Their organs are still to be found. Um, Renatus Harris, Father Smith, Gerard Smith, uh, Samuel Green, and, and Johann Snetzler. And we have a particular interest in Johann Snetzler here in Leicestershire. And I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about Snetzler. The next, the next one. Now, who was Johann Snetzler? Well, he was a German. He came from the southern part of Germany, the Black Forest. So he did business in Switzerland. He did business in, in Germany. And it was the time when, for example, there were distinct differences between British organs and German organs. German organs were beginning to have pedals. Uh, and of course, that was the uh, uh, support of people like Johann Sebastian Bach, who composed pretty well all his music for organs with pedal boards. Yet in England at that time, there was not a pedal board to be found. And Johann Snetzler was tipped off about this and he came to England in about 1745. He was based in London, but he did quite a lot of business in Leicestershire, curiously enough. Uh, now, the first organ that he built in England with pedals was inevitably the Lutheran Church in London. And he hoped that this would be an example to all the Anglican churches that were in, in the country without pedal boards. He invented a number of things and he's uh, credited with uh, inventing the Dulciana stop, in fact. And there are still one or two quite large organs uh, with uh, Snetzler pipework and Snetzler parts in. Uh, Kings Lynn Parish Church is well worth a visit. Halifax uh, Parish Church, Beverly Minster. It's a modern organ, but it's got lots of traces of Snetzler. And in Leicester, uh, he created the first organ for what is now Leicester Cathedral. It was St. Martin's uh, Church at that time. Actually, Snetzler returned to England in 1780-ish, uh, very disgruntled with the uh, business that he failed to get in this country. And of course, as soon as he'd gone, uh, organists were interested in having pedal boards. Let's have a look at the oldest organ in Leicester. Next one, please. It's Switzerland Church. And Switzerland is a, a very smart up market village, about halfway between Loughborough and Leicester. And the church there, St. Leonard's Church, very fashionable. Uh, it has one unique characteristic. It has a corner of its graveyard, especially for pets and animals of 
members of the church. And that's uh, quite a novelty. Anyway, Schnetzler's organ was installed in 1765. And just to put things in context, 1765 was five years after the death of Handel. So it was really early in the days of organ work in this country. It originally had a, a, a small number of stops, one manual, and it was a West End gallery organ. And I'll show you a slide in a moment. Uh, it was uh, not very usable after a while, and it was moved to a rear position. And eventually, uh, it had a, a West End extension, and there's been another West End extension recently, uh, which is very valuable for the parishioners, because the extension has a kitchen and toilets. And that's uh, quite a novelty in Anglican churches of that time, of course. Well, since then, it's been rebuilt a number of times, and it was rebuilt in the 1800s by uh, Stephen Taylor of Leicester. He put a second manual on. He had additional stops and pedals and the first electric blower that was used in the area. Since then, it's been restored by Martin Renshaw uh, with a lot of steps of the pipe work still there. Uh, Peter Collins retuned it and brought it up to modern concert pitch because the church was being used for concerts uh, in the village and uh, instrumentalists needed the correct pitch as, as they saw it. And so it's been modernized uh, quite a bit. Next slide. Now here's a, a, a view, not a very good photograph because it was taken about 1860, I believe, but it's of the West End organ and you can see the pipework in the organ on the platform at the West End. Well, soon after this, it was brought down into the uh, aisle and then it was put into what you might call a, a sort of transept. And the next slide uh, shows the present organ there it is, it's now two manuals, uh, increased number of stops, uh, and it's really very pleasant to, uh, to play. Um, I, I once or twice demonstrated it to uh, people like the U3A, and uh, I've always had a lot of fun with one of the stops, uh, which is a sort of trumpet stop, but it sounds awful. And uh, I, I tease some of the men, would you like to walk your daughter down the aisle to a trumpet voluntary using this stop. And of course they all have a laugh and uh, say it's not quite what they had in mind. Next slide, and this is uh, particularly interesting because it is the, the, the plate as it were on the side of the organ case uh, recording Snetzler's building of this organ and the date of 1765. Uh, and so it's in, it's in good condition and uh, it's certainly quite playable. And this, uh, this one stop is perhaps uh, not quite what we want. Right, the next slide. There are some Snetzler uh, uh, pedal boards. Uh, if you look hard for them, I mentioned Kings Lynn is one. There is a little estate chapel or church at Merivale, which is in the Southwest corner of, um, uh, of Leicestershire near near Hinckley and this is the uh, pedal board which has been uh, tarted up recently and you'll see there that it's a, a flat um, pedal board it's not concave it's not radiating at all uh, and that is the the pedal board that is attributed to Sletzler. I might say that I had some doubts about it because it had been tarted up so well that uh, you couldn't really tell, but that is an organ going back that far. So it's an interesting uh, church or chapel because the front is on the main road and the rear of the church is on the estate. So you can enter the church from either the main road or from the estate, depending on your status in life, I think is, is the way we put it. Well, some of these old historic organs uh, are of interest and there's been a a book produced recently, and I'm just going to show you the book, uh, if you can just make it out. The book is called Historic Organs of Leicestershire. It was written 12 years ago by David Shuka, and uh, it's his personal uh, selection. 
although he did have one or two people to help him, including, including myself. But he left uh, Leicester. He was on the staff of Leicester University. His wife became a vicar, and they are now living down in the Kent area. And he has given up his um, chemistry and is running a business now for uh, restoring organs. And you'll see he takes adverts in some of the organ magazines. And uh, he's an interest, interesting character. Uh, it's a pity he didn't stay longer in Leicestershire because he would have made a better job for his book, I think. But it's an interesting book to pick up and, and to have a look at. I noticed, in fact, that there, he had 100 printed originally, and I have copy number 66 or something like that. And he sort of autographed it in that way. So this is some of the evidence of Snetzler uh, in uh, Leicestershire and uh, around Leicester City. Next slide. Uh, I should explain that, in fact, uh, I am uh, professionally a metallurgist, so I'm interested in the materials that are used in organ pipes. And we have a little bit of leg pulling in the society in Nottingham um, over the use of certain types of metal. Traditionally, uh, the metals used are lead or tin and lead tin alloys in particular. Um, and zinc is also used because we're interested in the acoustics primarily of the metal and of course their expense. Tin is expensive, lead is cheaper, although things are changing a little bit now, courtesy of China using a lot of lead tin alloys for solder and for their electronics. Wood, of course, is used a lot, and these produce nice mellow sounds and to match the metallic uh, mellow sounds. Uh, they're usually seasoned pine or oak or something like that. Uh, these pipes are often painted or gilded for appearance. And the organ that I play in Loughborough, in fact, we had it completely restored uh, 15 years ago. And the deacons of the church decided they wanted it gilded. And so these uh, the pipes were all painted a gold color for a thousand pounds, much to the amusement of Peter Collins, who uh, did the restoration of the organ, but it made it look nice, even if it didn't sound very nice. So I had a lot of fun teasing people about this. But there is a, a unique organ that uh, amuses me because it's in uh, the Philippines, in the far east, uh, and this uses bamboos, which are the only hollow, uh, naturally occurring timber. And uh, it was built originally by a missionary who was in uh, the Philippines in the 1880s. And it's recently been uh, rebuilt by uh, Kleiss of Bonn in Germany and uh, is now sounding very good. In fact, there are some CDs that have been made using it. So there are a number of organ pipes. What about using copper or brass? Well, copper is a, a metal that is uh, very much attached to um, brass bands. And the, pro the problem with, with the copper is, of course, it does produce a brilliant sound. That's fine for uh, um, trumpet stops and uh, uh, reed stops of that sort, but not so good for accompanying hymns. And so a combination of the materials is required. But you can get some very effective copper a pipe work in which the copper pipes look out of the organ and look out towards the congregation and can make a brilliant uh, sound as and when is appropriate. Let's move on, otherwise I'll be here all night talking about materials. What about national builders? Well, it's interesting that there were no real national builders, I don't think, until uh, the Great Exhibition in 1850 in London, and then a couple of organ builders built uh, very impressive organs for the exhibition, uh, notably William Hill and Henry Willis. And the remains of uh, Han Henry Willis's organ, it was the Henry Willis Senior, known as Father Henry Willis to this day, um, it's still available in a cathedral down in the south of England. And the William Hill organ, of course, or uh, small parts of it can be found in uh, Birmingham Town Hall. So they were the national builders who uh, took up a, a, an important role for uh, reputation and for building. And then they would often have local agents 
to help them with the building in uh, local places. And on the next slide, we'll have a, a look at what, what has happened here in, uh, in Leicestershire. Well, we must look at the, the main city, of course, Leicester, and the main towns. I've l listed them there, Loughborough, Ashby, Hinkley, Melton Mowbray, Market Harbour. And there are two important builders set up in Leicestershire, in Leicester City, in the 1860s. And the amusing thing is, they were Stephen Taylor and Joshua Porritt, and they were both set up on the grounds that there wasn't a builder in Leicester. And within 10 years, there were two big builders in Leicester. These two gentlemen set up builders and worked throughout the county. Uh, when you look through the county, you come across Taylor organs and Porritt organs everywhere. And uh, it interests me as the, uh, the origin of uh, these organs and how they came about. In, in fact, Taylor always seemed to have the prestigious jobs. And Porritt had the, the village churches on the whole, or the, uh, what we now call the nonconformist churches, and they had a different type of business. Stephen Taylor was a joiner, and he used to work in Leicester primarily assembling the organs that were sent up from London. So he learned his trade by being an assembler, whereas Joshua Porritt did an apprenticeship in Hull. And as he was finishing his uh, um, period as an apprentice, somebody tipped him off. Why don't you go and work in Leicester? Big city, no organ builder. By the time he organised himself and got himself down to Leicester, he also got married as well, he suddenly discovered there was a rival here. So suddenly, over the space of 10 years, round about 1860, there were two organ builders in Leicester, so the whole position changed. Stephen Taylor was very much based in, in Leicester itself, but Porritt had some regional offices, including one uh, opposite... Uh, uh, Loughborough Baptist Church now in, in Baxter Gate in, in, in Loughborough. Uh, and so he set up uh, locally and you'll find his, uh, his organs and still a lot of the local parish churches in the, in the north part of the county. Next slide, please. Well, the, uh, the great target, of course, was Leicester. Leicester had one or two big uh, churches in the centre of the city. But at that stage, they didn't have a cathedral. And there was a lot of uh, haggling over this because Leicester was part of the Diocese of Peterborough. And there came a time in the early 1900s when Peterborough uh, Diocese realized it was, it was too big and unmanageable. And so they decided that the west end of uh, the diocese, that's Leicestershire in effect and Rutland, uh, should uh, be uh, set apart and ha have a cathedral and a diocese of its own. And there was a great deal of, in fact, politics involved with this because a number of churches uh, were vying for the uh, ability to be promoted to be cathedrals. Uh, in particular, the church in Melton Mowbray was very keen to have that uh, status. And uh, as a church, as a building, it, it matches uh, small cathedral status. But the problem is that Melton Mowbray really, in industrial revolution terms, is not a serious centre. Um, prior to industrial revolution, then Melton Mowbray might have been a good place. It, it's most famous today, of course, for having had Sir Malcolm Sargent as their organist for about 10 years. Um, and there's a plaque dedicated to Sir Malcolm Sargent, in fact, over the choir stalls in, in the church today. There were two organs in, two churches, I should say, in Leicester who were vying for the status. And in the end, St. Martin's Church uh, was raised to cathedral status in 1927. It was a very good choice. And I think we realize now what a good choice it was because alongside St. Martin's Church, was um, a Roman Catholic uh, centre. And uh, we now know that the body of Richard III was found there after the Battle of Bosworth. So having uh, a king buried alongside the cathedral graveyard 
what turned out to be a, a stroke of luck in many ways. Well, it was raised to a cathedral status in 1927. And on this slide, you can see that in fact, the, the first new organ was installed in 1660, but then a Snetzler organ in 1774. And uh, there were various additions to it, increase in number of manuals, increase in number of stops. It, the, the organ has been moved several times over the years um, and uh, Walker's rebuilt it using a lot of the Snetzler pipework. Harrison and Harrison have rebuilt it recently and it really does sound um, very effective. As national cathedrals goes, of course, it's a relatively small building. And this was one of the problems when they decided that they would rebury Richard III in the cathedral. They have done so, but uh, in some ways from the uh, uh, point of view of, uh, of worship and the way that services uh, can be held there, uh, his grave is, is in the way a little bit, I have to say that. And I admit, I am not an Anglican, I'm a nonconformist when I say that. But of course, the status of the cathedral has been increased hugely, and the number of uh, um, visitors they've been having, tourists, uh, is huge. Next slide. Well, something about my own church here. Uh, uh, you will probably, those who know me know, know exactly my, my history. I'm, I'm not a uh, from England, I'm from South Wales, and uh, I came here in uh, the 70s via Sheffield, and I'd been an organist in Cardiff, and I'd been an organist in Swansea before this, but when I came to Loughborough, I found that the Baptist Church was the musical church in the town, and I'll tell you something about the organist who was here at that time. I got involved with him, I acted as accompanist to him and got interested, of course, in the origins of the, the organ. And uh, the organ was not the original organ. The church uh, was built in uh, 1828. And later on, it merged with an, another Baptist church in the town. And uh, the story that you hear about whether they should have an organ or not really reflects upon the uh, theological changes that were taking place at that time. So the, org the church was built with a gallery, quite a big heating, uh, uh, so sort of seating uh, range. It had heating, it had a big pulpit, of course, it had the choir stalls, but no organ, because they were still remembering, I think, some of the strictures of Oliver Cromwell that uh, organs are not necessarily a good thing. Well, within 10 years, they decided that uh, for all sorts of reasons, including hymn singing and including uh, having uh, concerts, uh, then an organ was needed. And so they decided to have an organ. They raised the money quite quickly. There was no problem about that in those days because the members of the church were, were quite uh, well off in terms of uh, uh, factories for uh, producing knitwear and things of that sort. And the organ was supplied by Alexander Buckingham of Pentonville Road, literally along the long Pentonville Road from King's Cross Station. So it's very central position. Um, there's also a jail not very far away, of course, in Pentonville. And this caused uh, a lot of thought as to how they got the organ to Loughborough. Well, the Grand Union Canal, almost certainly. Well, it was built uh, without pedals, uh, and uh, that was a, a, a reflection of the uh, view of organists at that time. And uh, it was extended in 1890 with uh, pedals added. If we go to the next slide, I think we have a, a view of it. This is the original Buckingham organ. You can see there's a pulpit, uh, which is uh, very important in nonconformist churches at that time for good instructive sermons and behind the pulpit are the choir and it's quite interesting if you blow this picture up to see the quality of ladies hats in the choir so it's a ref social reflection on the dress of those days the organist you can see leaning over so that he can be seen by the cameraman 
you can see the, the pipes uh, uh, and the pipe case above him, space on either side, space for an organ with pipes, but no pipes, no, no pedals and uh, modest, modest pipe work. So that's the 1848 organ. And if we go on a little bit, we'll find that in fact, the, there was a, another Baptist church in, in Loughborough founded by quite different uh, basis. This is Woodgate Baptist Church. It's no longer there, I might add. And it was founded in 1882. And it too was built without an organ, but they very quickly decided they needed an organ. And a, a complete puzzle is that they had the organ built by F.H. Brown of Deal in Kent. Well, in the days when uh, trains and, uh, and lorries were not very uh, effective at transporting goods around the country, uh, I would have thought Deal in Kent was not particularly a good place to choose for buying an organ, but that's what they did. And it was built in 1889 uh, with just two manuals, uh, and then in uh, uh, the 1920s, it was completely rebuilt by Stephen Taylor of Leicester. And he added a manual. He put pedal boards in. And he also installed the Taylor tab stop system. So instead of having pull stops on uh, uh, jam uh, on each side of the, uh, the manuals, uh, they were tabs placed above the, the manuals, and I'll show you a better photograph of them in a, in a minute. The church closed in 1975, uh, and there's now a, a multi-story car park there in the centre of the town. Uh, the organ was taken to St Barnabas Church in Leicester. It was installed there, but it's now been declared redundant. The church is redundant, uh, including the, the organ. And I'm not quite sure what state the organ is in at the present time. But that was a brown organ. What is interesting is that browns have suddenly become a major organ builder in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And they've merged with, I think it's Manders in, in London. And uh, they're really uh, uh, expanding and uh, doing very well after a gap of maybe 50 years. The next... Next slide, please. Now, this is the, uh, uh, the picture of the organ uh, in Woodgate Church. You'll see that it's um, that the pipework is again behind the pulpit. So there's no need for an altar here. What is important is the, is the, uh, the pulpit where the word is preached from. But the interesting thing about this organ, it had uh, tubular pneumatic action. And the console, you can see the co console just at the bottom of the photograph, there's a little light on uh, uh, above the console. And uh, what happened there was that the organist sits in the front row of the, uh, the pews. Uh, it's, it's a rather curious um, position for a, a console. You don't find it very often, but there's one other church I know where it is and it's in Swansea, but that's uh, totally unrelated to, uh, to this particular organ. You can see on the right and left-hand side, there's the uh, part of the gallery and the gallery went all the way around the church and it, you could seat a lot of people on, uh, on good occasions. Next. Well, something about other organs in Loughborough because there have been some changes uh, in the recent times. First of all, Loughborough Parish Church uh, has always had a, a bit of a mixed feeling about organs. The original organ was installed in 1901 and it was a mixture of Ingram and Hope Jones. So it was been uh, uh, cannibalized really from what you might call cinema organs. Uh, and it was soon unreliable. And uh, Porritt in fact, put in a proposal for rebuilding it as a, a three manual 46 stop organ, but it was never realized. They were always dithering about this, that and the other and how much it was gonna cost and where they should put it. Uh, and uh, they wanted to put the console in uh, what you call the transept and the organ pipes at the back of the church, the rear of the church, where they are to this day. Um, and it's never been terribly satisfactory, and yet uh, uh, the sound of the organ is, is excellent. Uh, they, in 1968, 
They cannibalized a bins organ from the Bridgeway Hall Methodist Church in Nottingham. They rebuilt by Willis and two of the people who, one of the persons who helped to rebuild it for Willis was a member of our society in Nottingham till about four years ago until he, he died. And he remembered and told me at some length uh, the problems they had in installing it. Trinity Methodist Church is a church that uh, I'm very strongly connected with because the three main uh, free churches in, in Loughborough have got together recently and certainly the choirs have got together and we now have a, a united free church choir in the town. Trinity Methodist Church um, was put together in 1966 from three Methodist churches in the town and there were two more Methodist churches who didn't want to join in. So Trinity is not theological, it's the fact that three churches came together, all Methodist churches, to form a new church. And the organ in that church had been built originally by Brindley and Forster of, of Sheffield, and it was powered by water. And uh, one of the biggest costs to the church, in fact, over the years, had been the cost of water, because every time you wanted to sing a hymn, you had to turn the water on, and it generated uh, wind through the blowers. It was electrified in 1951, but that was really a little bit late. It was transferred to Trinity in 1966 by Willis, rebuilt in 2001 with a detached console, and it's a very effective sound now. It's a uh, uh, pipework is up in the right hand side of the organ as you look uh, forward and the console is on the side of the platform and it's a nice organ to play and it's very effective for uh, choral work. Let's move on. Next slide. Uh, the, rec the most recent problem has been pipe organs being taken down and replaced. And this is a reflection of the national scene. And uh, I, I've put this list together for you to see because you will recognize what is happening in your own area, I'm sure. St. Mary's Church in Ashby Road is a Roman Catholic church, very active, very lively. They had a tailor organ there, uh, which in fact, um, I played several times when I came to, to Loughborough because they were always short of an organist for a wedding. And they were very happy for a non-conformist organist to play for a wedding on a Saturday, but not so happy playing for a service on the Sunday, which rather amused me. So uh, that was very effective, but it was scrapped in the 1990s. Holy Trinity um, in, in Moore Lane became disused in the 1990s and they now have merged with the parish church. They had a porrit organ uh, and I played that uh, from time to time because there was a, a shortage of organists when I came to the town. So they were glad to have anybody. Emmanuel Parish Church is, is the biggest uh, uh, church in the fashionable area, if you like, of Loughborough on Forest Road. Uh, it had a tailor organ, which was built in 1866 and it was uh, enlarged and improved in the 1886 on the West Gallery and was a very nice organ, except for one thing, it was out of pitch with present um, concert pitch. And uh, I, I certainly had problems with it several times because I was accompanist to the choral society in the town for a long time. And we once or twice had problems needing an orchestra and the organ for a performance of say an oratorio and they were not in tune. And I remember on one occasion, we were going to sing Benjamin Britten's St. Nicholas. And we had to do without the organ part and use two pianos uh, to imitate the piano line and the organ line. And that really was the, the, the beginning of the end of the organ. Uh, to, to rebuild it and restore it was going to cost over a hundred thousand pounds. And the church decided not to spend that money. And what they did in fact was to scrap the organ and it was sold eventually to a firm in France. Um, and they bought an electronic organ and they bought an Allen organ. Now the Allen company is an American company, but it so happened 
there was already an Allen organ in Loughborough at the university. And so I think there was some influence from university staff over this. And uh, the Allen organ is a three manual 35 stop organ. It's, it's really very nice to play and it makes a nice sound with uh, loudspeakers on the rear gallery where the, the West End organ was placed. And St. Peter's Church now is, is a sort of redundant church. It's used by some of the evangelical uh, groups and families. The organ is still there, uh, but I'm not sure how much it's used, so I can't make any real comment about that. Frederick Street was originally a congregational church. It's now a URC church. They scrapped their organ uh, some years ago, in, and now they've bought an electronic organ and it's a making Johannes organ uh, and it makes a big sound and uh, it's it's really uh, very effective uh, in its way but of course just like all electronic organs you don't have the ambience that you have with a pipe organ and then lastly St Mary's Church in Nanpanton was originally a village organ and village church uh, the church was built in 1888. The organ was installed a few years later, and it was built by Lloyds of Nottingham. And L L L Lloyds were an important organ builder around the turn of the century. Uh, it was a two manual organ, uh, and it uh, just suffered from lack of attention. And in the end, they too were faced with a big bill or replace it. <coughs> Excuse me. And they were replaced it with an electronic organ which for the size of the church, the church has a, a seating capacity as seen of probably under a hundred, yet it's in a fashionable area of the town and there are more people than that attending services there. So they have overflow uh, congregations. So that's a, a different sort of problem and one which is, is nice to hear about. Right, let's move on to the next slide. Well, I've listed here some national builders. Uh, it's always interesting to think of the national builders because uh, they do appear in the uh, uh, parts of the country where there are not uh, organ building companies. And you'll see some of these uh, names all around the place. Um, Hill, Norman and Beard and Willis are still in business. Bins went out of business some years ago in 1929. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in Bin's organs in Nottingham uh, because the Albert Hall in Nottingham is uh, a Bin's organ that's been uh, very well restored. Nicholson are a, a firm in, in Morgan and Worcester and they're doing very well. They've recently built a big cathedral organ uh, at Sandaff Cathedral in Cardiff and that sounds really good. Harrison and Harrison are probably the leading builders in the country they're based in Durham, and they too are building organs, uh, at, not only in this country, but in other countries as well. And if I can hark back to my origins, they have recently built a, a big cathedral organ at St. David's, which was the source of much amusement in, to organists in South Wales, because they, they were laughing, they said, when they heard that Harrison and Harrison had got the contract. They're in Durham. You think they'll be able to find St. David's? Well, they did successfully, and uh, it's in fact uh, being used quite a bit by the BBC, and you have sounds of uh, songs of praise services coming from Harrison organs in the St. David's Cathedral. You hear these on Sundays at the present time. Next, uh, next slide, please. Well, what about local builders? Let's say something about them. Uh, they were doing very well at 1900, at the turn of the century. Uh, Stephen Taylor, I mentioned, of course, and uh, then he started shrinking a little bit. And Richard Young, who is now in rugby, was the son of the last uh, skilled builder in the Taylor Company. And he now looks after a lot of the uh, of the organs that were built originally by, by Taylor. Uh, Joshua Porritt, they finished in, uh, in the 1850s. They were taken over by an organ firm, but unfortunately that organ firm had a big fire in Liverpool 
and all the records were lost and the Porrid Company disappeared. Peter Collins was originally in the London area and he was a, a small, uh, selective, skilled company and they moved to Melton Mowbray on the grounds that there was a very good offer made to them for a, a factory unit on the industrial estate in Melton Mowbray. And it had the virtue of having a very high roof or ceiling. And this made it very convenient for an organ builder because he could assemble the organs in the workshop before they took them out to the uh, recipient church or, or cathedral. Then uh, we now have a, a Midland organ company just outside Melton Mowbray and they've taken over Heal and Company. Uh, they're at Burton Lazar's and they do quite a little bit of work in India. Uh, and that's a, a, an interesting uh, uh, business that's developed. Cousins uh, were originally, I think, in Lincoln. They were, spent some time in Leicester and they've recently moved to Colville. Uh, and there they've taken a unit on an industrial estate and it's a, it, it's a, it's a very nice setup there. In Nottinghamshire, I mentioned Lloyd, and they were part of Lloyd Dudgeon for many years in, in Nottingham City. And today, Henry Groves are the leading organ builders in the Nottingham City area. And they have had some quite prestigious jobs, most recently at Melton Mowbray Church. Uh, and that does sound very good. And the next slide. Here's a picture of Stephen Taylor, typical Victorian gentleman. Uh, I'll quickly go through the next few slides because it, it take up a bit of time. Next one, Ian, please. Here's the family tree for Stephen Taylor. And it amuses me that Stephen Taylor uh, developed quite large families. And he had one son who was an engineer. Uh, and, uh, one, and he looked after blowers and he made, set up a company making blowers for organs. And normally you'd have had to buy the blower blowers from another company. Then they had an organ builder and an organ performer. They had one organist and they called him Cardinal. I don't know quite opt what optimism there was in calling your son a Cardinal, uh, but nevertheless that was so. And he had two daughters who presumably looked after the books and made the tea. That's a sexist remark for you. Anyway, coming down in the family, the last uh, uh, member of the family really was a physics a teacher and physics technician. He had little interest in organ building and this is why the firm collapsed uh, in, the 18, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, but Mr. Young, Richard Young, is trying to keep the reputation going. He's doing quite well. <coughs> Next slide, please. Well, it's amusing that uh, the organ builders in those days used to advertise their wares and I made quite a collection of adverts for organ builders. You just don't see these today, but these would have appeared in the in the evening paper, for example, and uh, some of the uh, weekly uh, magazines. Next slide. We can whip through the next few slides. Ian. Here's another one. Nelson Street, London Road. Here he is again, organ builder with a, a, a picture of one of his organs. Uh, and the next one. Another one, Leicester, and the lists of all the churches that he's built organs for. Now let's stop here for a moment and have a look at uh, one or two of these consoles. Here is a pre-1900 Taylor console. It's in Wimeswold Parish Church. And Wimeswold is uh, really on the boundary of uh, Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire. And it's quite a, a fashionable uh, a village to live in. Uh, and you'll see these are draw stops on each side. A nice console. The next slide shows some of the pipework. And these are typical lead tin sort of pipes uh, of that era. But if we go on a little bit, I think the next slide shows... Uh, oh, this, is, this is something that we can, we can move on. That's... Uh, I, I'm, I'm watching, watching the time uh, a little bit. Here's a manual church which sold its Taylor organ to France. And here was a photograph taken before it was moved. Uh, the French, when they bought it and collected, they couldn't assemble it. And they came to uh, uh, 
uh, the East Midlands tried to find somebody who could assemble a tailor organ in France. And the outcome of this is somewhat uncertain because to the best of my knowledge, they never found anybody prepared to go to France to assemble an old Taylor organ. It's a pity because it, it had a nice sound, uh, but it become a bit rattly in particular uh, with the pedals. Then next slide. Here's the Emmanuel Church console, typical 1880, draw stops, three manuals, uh, and so on. nothing very special about it at all. Uh, but it's as we would recognize it today. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting organ, and this is in Leicester. Uh, and there is one or two interesting organs in Leicester, and this is one that has interested me. It, it's a post-1900 Taylor organ. And I say that post-1900 because it was about 1900 to 1905 that Taylor invented his tab stops. And you can see the organist here, and one or two of you may know this organist because he has an organ building business just outside Melton Mowbray. And he's there looking at the tab stops and you can see them all there above the, uh, the third manual. Uh, and the idea is that they're much easier to see, much easier to operate. And the tab stop system has been used quite widely by the electronic organ um, builders because it is easier to have a switch system, an electrical switch system that way, rather than have the draw stops, which involved electromagnetic uh, systems. Now, this is St. Peter's Church in Highfields, Leicester. Uh, and it, it's, it's a nice big church. It's a nice large organ. The organ is in need of attention. And part of the problem in this church is location, because they're located in very much the the Muslim area of Leicester. And as you probably know, Leicester has one of the biggest Muslim Indian populations outside India. And uh, here the church is used quite frequently for uh, non-Christian funerals because in the area of Highfields, it's one of the few large assembly places in the area. But the organ is still being used on Sundays. Uh, how many attend the services there? I have no idea. Next. Now, this is the, the biggest job that Stephen Taylor ever had. It's the De Montfort Hall in Leicester, which is the concert hall in Leicester. Uh, it holds between uh, 1,800 and 2,000 people when it's full. Stephen Taylor built it as a three manual 46 stop instrument in 1914. In fact, he half built it in 1914 and the other half was built at the end of the First World War. And the money for the organ was provided by one of the sock manufacturers in Leicester, because Leicester has always been very much a knitwear sort of city. Uh, it's, it's a super organ to play. It has uh, tab stops, of course, uh, and it has some draw stops. stops. It's, it's a bit of both. Uh, and it, it's really quite a thrilling organ to play. Um, I had the privilege of playing it for, because the, the, the Baptist churches of Great Britain uh, decided to have their annual assembly at the De Montfort Hall in 1969, I think it was. And they didn't seem to be able to find an organist. So they went shopping around the Baptist churches of the county and ended up with me and my colleague. So I, uh, I played this for a congregation of 2,000 all willing singers for popular hymns. It really was quite an experience. Um, the, the only odd thing, I specially prepared a, a very impressive um, voluntary for them at the end of one of the sessions. And the recording engineer decided I was just fooling about and he, he cut off the recording. So I've got a recording of the whole service, except the voluntary at the end. So that's what some people think. Next one. Here's the console. And you can see here that uh, the, the tab stops just below the desk. And there are a couple of draw stops on the, each side, in fact. Uh, but it's a very comfortable organ to play, I must say. Next. Now, here's the former Woodgate uh, Church in, in Loughborough, the organ, uh, the Taylor organ of 1925. And again, you can see the tab stops just below the music uh, desk. 
and uh, uh, I only played this once or twice before the uh, church was was knocked down. Uh, but uh, I'm told it was a nice, comfortable organ uh, to play. Next. I think we can uh, do away with Mr. Taylor's uh, organ blower adverts. Here's another one of the Taylor motor and blower. And again. Now here's, here's an inter interesting organ because I got involved with a uh, an organ, organist and a church in Sully Hill, uh, because it was built by Porritt about the same time as uh, our Porritt organ, and they wanted somebody to uh, restore the organ. They got the money, but they didn't have the permission, because in the Anglican church, you have to get permission of the organ advisor for the diocese. And the organ advisor for their diocese was the organist of Hereford Cathedral at that time. And he obviously regarded this request from Solly Hell as being uh, uh, a bit of a waste of time because after about a year, he still hadn't given permission or even been to visit it. So in the end, uh, they uh, decided to go to London and see if they could find get permission from uh, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Whereupon the organist of Hereford Cathedral decided to um, retire. And so they could bypass him. They went down to London and they said, have you got another porrit organ round and about? And he had the answer. He said, oh, there's one in Loughborough. They said, go and find out what they've done. So he came over to Loughborough and I spent uh, several days with him, put him in the direction of Peter Collins. And so he followed up our a restoration with a restoration for his organ. And there it is in uh, just outside Solihull, south of uh, Birmingham. Next one. Not Leicestershire, I'm afraid. Oh, m move on. I don't think we want the, the porridge family tree for the moment. That's another advert. Move on, please. And again. This is Markfield Parish Church. Markfield is a, a village just outside uh, Loughborough. And uh, the organ is, was built within one year of our organ. And you can sit at the console and think it's the same organ. One difference, this has two manuals. We have three manuals. And so it's just that little bit smaller and different. But it's amazing how an organ builder can put his stamp on a console and you can say immediately, uh, that it's so-and-so's organ. Next, next, please. Now, this is the, uh, the church organ that I play. Um, and here again, we had the church re redesigned so that a choir can be put uh, below on the platform. There's a mobile pulpit uh, in, in front. And the organ has these pipes that were uh, painted with a gold gilt uh, finish so they look nice and they certainly still do look very nice. So it's uh, um, basically a, a mechanical action uh, organ uh, with a little bit of electrification uh, for extension work done in the 1990s. Next. 